just stops. <laughs> Good morning, St. Mark's. All right, I can tell you guys are very excited this morning. Everybody's awake and happy. Let me do it one more time. Good morning, St. Mark's. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, friends, we are just here today to worship God and uh, to bask in his presence and to send some glory on back up his way. So if you guys are ready to worship this morning, let's all rise together as we sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, yeah. open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. I'm not afraid 
Go to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you today singing your praises. Father, we just pray that you would be here uh, with all of us worshiping. Father, just be in our lives. Help open our hearts. Um, Father, just, just make something beautiful out of this entire day um, and uh, help us be a light that shines, that everyone will see. It's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
holy Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go, and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. Good morning, church. I'm Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad you are here to worship with us on this first Sunday of August. This is back to school month. All the parents say, yay! All the kids say, boo! And and the poor teachers. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, But we are glad that you are here. Uh, If you are watching with us online, we are glad you are watching with us in the comment section. There's a link for you to fill out an online connect card. Uh, as well as a place to be able to give online. We're glad that you're watching with us. You might be able to tell from the picture we're going to have communion today. So uh, if at some point in time you can go grab some uh, something like bread and something like juice and have it with you so that you can participate with us from your home, uh, we would invite you to do that as well. If you're here in person, we've already supplied that for you. There's also a connect card on the back table. Uh, Whether you're here for the first time or been here for years, we'd love for you to let us know that you are here so that we can be praying for you. There's a place where you can let us know if you have any prayer requests. You can put all this in the offering basket along with any offering you might have. And uh, it's just our way of being able to know that you are here so that we can serve you the best that we possibly can. We have a lot of stuff getting ready to come up. Like back to school time is also 
launch everything time for everybody. So we have a lot of things coming up. First of all, on August 21st, it's our back to school bash. It's uh, gonna be from two to four out on the front lawn. We'll have inflatables, we'll have Kona ice, we'll have the bookmobile, because you kids haven't read all summer long. Uh, we'll have all sorts of fun stuff to do, and so we'd love for you to come and be a part of that with us. On August 24th, we're gonna be starting up Grief Share again. Um, it'll be both in the morning and in the evening. Uh, so two different sessions that you can choose from, but if you or someone you love is walking through a time of grief, this is a great 13-week uh, program that uh, you can participate in and uh, with some other people from around the community who are going through some of the same things. So we would invite you to that. If you have any questions about it, please call the church office and let us know. I've also been uh, trying to make sure that you are aware uh, that on August 28th, we're going to have kind of a special uh, Sunday that day. The sermon topic will be on Christianity and suicide. We're calling it Hope Lives Here. Uh, and we're actually going to be partnering with the Adamus Board and NAMI and Family Resource Center and some other agencies to have a conversation that day as well as some follow-up conversations that will be held here in the dock. Uh, around the topic of suicide, but that Sunday morning we'll specifically be talking about that. If that's something that you're like, man, I just don't know if I'm going to be comfortable being here that day, I just want to make sure you know before you walk in that that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but maybe you know some folks that this could be a really good conversation for them to be a part of. So we'd also invite you to uh, invite them to come and to be a part of that with us. Other stuff that's going to be coming up, uh, we're going to be doing St. Mark's University. We're going to be starting that mid-September where we're going to be offering uh, college-level Bible and uh, faith courses. Um, so, but it's free tuition, and also I'm not grading your papers. Uh, so, uh, but you are welcome to come to that, and uh, we're going to have four different classes, and so the first session will be this fall. Uh, but we'd invite you to come be a part of that. We're also going to be opening up something called the Play Cafe here in the dock. Uh, starting in September for kids and, and their families to come and just to burn off some energy, right? And uh, so Corinne can tell you more about that, but a lot of stuff coming up. This is just like a sampling of some of it. Um, and just, I say all of that to say, we're doing a lot of things and I just so appreciate um, uh, if you've been able to give throughout the summer. I know that sometimes you go on vacation and stuff like that, so you don't think about it. But thank you to everybody who's been um, uh, giving throughout the summer. Uh, I know that sometimes there's a little bit of a summer lull. We're going back to school. We've got a lot of things that we're doing, and it's your generosity and uh, your faithful giving that makes all of that possible. So thank you for that. If you ever have any questions about your giving, you can contact the church office, and we'd be happy to, to uh, give you any information that you need. But at this point, I want to invite Corinne to come up for our children's moment. And another special announcement, right? Woo! Good morning. Oh, hello. Come on up. Hello, hello. I see more. Everybody's welcome. Children at heart, that's fine too. Hello. Hi. Good morning. All right. Today we're going to play a game, okay? I don't know if you've ever heard of this game, okay? We'll see. It's called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay, so I'm going to tell you two truths and a lie, and you guys have to guess which one the lie is. Can you do it? Yeah? You're all very smart. I can already tell just by looking at you that you're very smart. Okay, it's the glasses, Rachel. That's what's doing it. You're really smart. I know it. Okay, number one, coffee is my favorite drink in the whole world. Number two, I am the oldest of four kids in my family. And number three, I have an arm made out of metal. So, hold on, hold on. Which one do you think is a lie? Arm made out of metal? You don't think that I have an arm made out of metal? You, you haven't even touched it, though. You don't know what it's made out of. I'd have to keep it still all the time so I couldn't move it, right? Okay. So you're telling me that I'm lying about my arm being made out of metal. You don't believe that. 
Oh, you've seen me drink coffee? Okay. <laughs> All right. Nobody doubted the so coffee. So you think I'm the oldest out of my siblings? You think that you think that your mom is younger than me? You can say, yeah, she'll be happy about that. How, you can't ask me how old I am? Rude. Okay. So you don't believe me about my arm because it looks like a normal arm, right? Okay. I mean, if that's what you believe, you're telling me that seeing is believing. That's what you're telling me. Okay, fine. I'll show you. Hold on, wait. Let's see here. So you're telling me that this isn't in my arm. You don't think that's in my arm? This is my x-ray. At the doctor, they took this x-ray. I made this up. So did I cut my own arm open and leave this big scar? How about this scar right here? I have two big scars. You're telling me that's a lie? I just did that to fool you guys? I mean, I've done some pretty cool tricks, but that would be going a little extra far. Okay. So what's the lie? So I'm actually the youngest out of three kids. I'm not the oldest of four, right? Yeah. So that was my lie. And you're my niece, and you didn't even know? <laughs> okay. All right. It's fine. I forgive you. I forgive you. So now that you've seen the truth with your own eyes, this is two plates and 14 screws, by the way. Do not play on the top bunk of your bunk bed, okay? Don't do it. It's dangerous. I was 10. It was like before Christmas. How did I open my presents? I don't know. Okay. So now that you've seen it with your own eyes, do you believe me that my arm has metal in it? It's made out of metal. I'm like a robot arm. It's cool. Yeah. Set off metal detectors and stuff. It's fun. So I'm going to tell you about a man who had a hard time believing in something also. So he had a really sick son. His son was sick his whole life. And this guy, he tried and tried and tried to help his son by getting him better. He didn't want him to be sick anymore, so he did everything that he could think of to make his son better, right? So he tried and he tried until one day Jesus came upon a crowd in this crowd, they were all arguing with some of the disciples and, because they told the disciples to heal the man's son, and they couldn't do it. So the man had brought his son there, asking him to heal him. Well, Jesus came out, and he said, You're all unbelieving. You're an unbelieving generation. Why should I still put up with you? I think he was getting a little annoyed, right? So he was like, Guys, come on. I've healed people. I've fed people. Why can't you believe that this can happen? They just didn't believe it. So the father of the little boy said, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus was like, if I can, like, come on, haven't you seen what I've done? Everything is possible for one who believes. That's what Jesus said. So the man said, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Like, what? Like, I believe, but it's hard because I've tried everything and nothing worked, right? So, obviously, Jesus healed the man's son. He cast out his demons, and the son was better. He was 100% better. So, like you guys struggled to believe that I had a robotic metal arm, the crowd in that man, they struggled to believe that Jesus could heal that boy. This is why we have faith, right? We have never seen God with our own eyes, but we have seen his miracles. We have seen his beauty and everything he's created with us. You see that sunshine out there? A hot day, it's beautiful. That's one of God's miracles. He created that for us. And that is the truth. I wouldn't lie about that. All right. Will you guys pray with me? Okay. Dear God, thank you for showing us your love even when we don't see it right away. Even when we have doubts. We remember all that you've done for us. Please help us to love others in this way and help them see your goodness through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, before you go. We don't have back. Hello? Oh, I'm here. All right. We don't have backstage kids today, but I have some praise packs for you if you want to take one with you to your seat. And I have a special announcement. Emmy, come here, please. So, this is Amelia. Raise your hand, say hi. No? Okay, she said hi. So, Amelia and Evie, her twin sister, they just had a birthday, right? How old are you? Nine. Nine. Oh my goodness. Okay, so for their birthday, my sister's very extra. She's throwing them 
<laughs> the mullet of birthday parties. So it's work in the front, party in the back, right? So they're doing a lemonade stand. And in the front yard, they're going to have a lemonade stand set up. It, everything's on this flyer. There's some on the back table. So if you would love to come by and have a nice fresh glass of lemonade, then they would appreciate that. And all the proceeds are going to go to what? Do you know? Team Emmy? Go Team Emmy. Emmy was born with congenital heart defect. So she's had four open heart surgeries and some other surgeries happening. And so all the proceeds are going to go to that. They're doing a walk in September. So all the money is going to go towards that, right? Yay! And they had to cut her, I know. All right, well, you guys can go. If you want a praise pack, I'll put them right over here, and you can come grab one before you go sit down, okay? Almost in the double digits there. When I was uh, preparing the songs, I, I went through and uh, I was looking at the, the Psalms, uh, which I think, what is it, 19, 1 through 5, I think. And uh, I just happened to glance at the Messages version, which I, I, I do like the Message Bible. You know, it's kind of interesting to get a little bit of a different read. But I really like the song reading, so I'm just going to uh, read this for you real quick before we do our next song here. So Psalm 19. God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Uh, Madam Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures every evening. Their words aren't heard, their voices aren't recorded, but their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. The morning sun, a new husband leaping from his honeymoon bed, the daybreaking sun, an athlete racing to the tape. Just really liked how they phrased that.
worship the King. Come, worship the King. Well, we have a couple of scriptures today from Psalm 19. Verses 1 through 4, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. And then from the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 9, verse 24, simply says, Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. So we're starting a series today called Bring Your Doubts, where we're going to be talking about about doubts, doubts you might have in your faith life. Uh, In a recent survey of American Christians, they were asked, Do you ever experience doubt in your faith? Have you experienced any doubt in your faith life? And 95% said that they have experienced at some point at least some doubt, right? Some said all the time. Some said often. Some said rarely, but it has happened. But only 5% of people said that they have never had any doubt in their faith. And that is terrific if that is you. Uh, but I count myself among the 95%. There have been times where, you know, we've, I've experienced some doubt, right? And the survey went on to ask, what are the things that cause you to doubt? And so over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at the top three reasons that people said that they've had some doubt. Today, we're going to be talking about just the very existence of God. How do we know any of this is even true? Next week, we're going to talk about the uh, kind of two mixed together, right? The idea of of suffering, innocence, and unanswered prayers. Those things can kind of go together sometimes. And then finally, we're going to ask the question, is Jesus really the only way? So uh, these all seem to be areas where many of us experience at least some instances of doubt. And again, on August 28th, then, we're going to kind of bookend this series by talking about Christianity and suicide, uh, a topic that for a lot of people will cause them to have some questions. How can a loving God let something like this happen, right? So um, I want to tell you that I think that it's important for us to have doubts. Uh, Every single leader of faith in in Scripture, they all wrestled with doubt, every one of them. It, It can be a pathway to a deeper faith right? It it can help us to examine our faith. It keeps us from being gullible or taken advantage of or or believing something that maybe we shouldn't believe. Are are these things really trustworthy? Should I put my faith in these things? But doubt can also be a hang-up that can keep us from moving forward uh, when we should be taking steps of faith. So we're going to talk about doubt today. On June 23rd, 1992, I went to the grocery store with my mom. Now, I can tell you for sure that it was that day, because while I was there, I saw this headline in the newsstand, Bat Child Found in Cave. And and, and my mind was blown. I couldn't believe it. Um, It was, it shook me to my core, you know, I'm standing at checkout line and see this, my mind flooded with questions. How is this possible? Are there more? He looked a little like me. Are we related? Like, are there other human and animal hybrids? Like, I had so many questions. And so I I grabbed my mom and I I showed her and expected her to be as surprised as I was. But instead, she seemed dubious. She's like, I'm not sure that's real. I'm like, Mom, there's a picture. You know, like, like, of course it's real. And so I went home to the... um, to the source of all knowledge at that point in, in history, the World Book Encyclopedia. And I, and I tried to do a little bit of research. Kids, encyclopedias are when grown-ups used to print off the internet. 
and sell it door to door. Uh, it, so I, I looked, at, and you know what? I found maybe my mom is right. There was no entry for Bat Boy in the World Book Encyclopedia. There was there were no other human animal hybrids. So I figured maybe she was right. Maybe this wasn't true. I did learn a lot when I looked up the word tabloid, and I figured out what tabloids were, and realized, oh, maybe this was not to be trusted, right? So we all do this. We, we hear something, a doubt is raised, and so we try to figure out what the truth is, what is true, and we move forward a little bit wiser when we do. Oz Guinness, who's a, a great theologian, he said it this way, if ours is an examined faith, we should be unafraid to doubt. If doubt is eventually justified, then what we were believing clearly was not worth believing. But if doubt is answered, then our faith grows stronger. It, it knows God more certainly. It can enjoy God more deeply. So doubt can be a good thing in that sense. We examine our faith, right? Uh, unfortunately, many people don't really examine their faith. And um, but we should be doing this, right? Digging in a little bit deeper. Yes, we're supposed to have the faith of a child, but we're also supposed to be adults and do our homework and, and, and learn more. Faith is not meant to be synonymous with gullibility. It's meant to be questioned and critiqued, and when it's found to be trustworthy, then we can take an even deeper step into our faith. We can, even, we can go even a little bit farther and follow. You know, there were times throughout history when a little bit of doubt from people of faith could have really helped things out, right? When, when the Crusades happened and people said, everybody over there is an infidel and we need to go kill them, that's God's way. You know, if some people would have said, mm, I'm not so sure. Or, or back when um, in, here in the United States with the rise of the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, um, it was shrouded in this Christian language. And if you know, so often people just failed to stop and say, wait, is this consistent with what Jesus taught? It, is this consistent with the Sermon on the Mount, with loving, loving our neighbors as ourselves and, and even loving our enemies as Jesus called us to? But because they failed to stop and cast out and ask questions, more than six million Protestant Christians signed on. Right? There's a place for good, honest doubt for asking questions. So how do we decide what's true then? How do we decide, how do we figure it out? If there are people who are cloaking things in religious language and sometimes even appealing to our darker side with words that can be confusing or even, you know, sound faith-filled, you know, how do we know what's right? So in, in the Methodist denomination, in our heritage, we have um, these tools that we use to kind of discern what is true? What is right? Uh, John Wesley called it the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Um, and it, it really meant this. It, it was four different tools that we use. The first is Scripture. Scripture is the number one thing. We go to Scripture to see what's true. Does it line up with Scripture, especially the New Testament, especially the teachings of Jesus? Does, does this situation, does this topic, does this thing, does it line up with what was taught in Scripture? But when something doesn't seem to be clear in the scripture, you know, if you're like, man, I'm just not sure, like it just, it doesn't seem to really speak exactly to my situation, we have other tools. One of them is tradition. What has been the tradition of the church? What have we, what have uh, theologians and, and, and church leaders and Christians throughout the ages, what have they believed about this? So that's another tool that we have. And then we have reason. God gave us reason. He gave us minds. He gave us brains. We can figure things out. And, and what does our reason tell us about a situation? And then the experiences of the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit moving in certain situations? How is the Holy Spirit moving in our lives? And what is that teaching us about different things? So those are some of the ways that we use to try to figure out what is true, what is right. So doubt can be good, and it can be important, and it's, and it's normal. Life very seldom will give us just absolute certainty about things. Somewhere along the line, we take a leap of faith oftentimes. I mean, that's what marriages are, right? You say these vows when you're, when you're young, 
and, and, and you say, we're going to be together forever. And, and then, like, forever is a really long time, right? So Holly and I, we knew we loved each other when we got married. We, we knew it, and we knew we wanted to be together forever. But I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there were times that even though we, we fully loved each other, that there had to have been times where you know, we questioned, can we really make it all the way? Um, a couple years ago, we were on vacation, and um, I woke up after what I perceived to be a very restful night's sleep. Um, Holly was nowhere to be found. She was, I, I went out, she was in the kitchen, and I went to give her a hug and tell her good morning, and she pushed me away. I said, hey, are you okay? And she said, no. I didn't sleep at all last night. Your snoring was so bad. And then she showed me the video of my snoring that, that she took. And then the camera would pan back to her face. And there was murder in her eyes. Like, I'm pretty sure she's like, till death do us part. Death is coming soon for you. And, you know, so I do it. Like, hey, something's got to change. I've got to change something to, to try to fix this thing, this, this snoring issue, right? And, and that's what marriage is. It's, it's being almost sure but not completely sure and working through the doubt and towards certainty. It's true in every major decision in life. And when we look at Scripture, when we look at the Bible, the great men and women of the faith <clears throat> they, they all struggle with doubt and with uncertainty. You can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. I mean, that's, that's what the serpent originally tested Adam and Eve with, was uncertainty, was with doubt. Did God really say that you would die if you ate this fruit? I think that God's just holding out on you, maybe, right? It's like putting uncertainty in their minds. Abraham is seen as a paragon of the faith. In Genesis 15, we're told that Abraham believed the Lord and it's credited to him as righteousness, right? God sees it as a good thing when we trust him. But there were critical points in Abraham's life where he doubted, where he was worried for his own life and he was worried like a king was going to kill him and take his wife. So he said, nah, it's totally my sister, right? Like just things like that, that, that where he doubted and he wasn't sure. Moses spends the entire scene of the burning bush questioning God and just throwing doubt and uncertainty his way. I, are you, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Who am I to go and to speak? The people aren't going to listen to me. God, you don't know what you're doing. I can't speak in front of people. I don't talk so good. Like on and on and on. Like just question after question. And when God does finally use Moses, and he and he does all these miracles, and he brings the people out of Egypt, and he, he parts the Red Sea, and the people walk through. Immediately, the people are like, hmm, but is God going to take care of us now? Like, I don't know, maybe we should go back to Egypt. You know, I'm not sure about this God. Like, he just parted the Red Sea. It doesn't matter. Like, doubt creeped in instantly, right back in the, we go on and on and on. And then I think about Jesus and the man in Mark 9. His son had been seized by an evil spirit and to the point where he can't speak and it throws him down on the ground and he has seizures. And he brings the boy to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Jesus, if you can do anything, would you help him out? And Jesus says, if I can, if anything is possible for the one who believes. And the boy's father exclaims, I do believe. Help my unbelief, right? I do have faith. Help my lack of faith, which I love. I love that statement because to me, it captures so perfectly where many of us are. I believe. Help my unbelief. I, I have faith. Help my lack of faith. Have you ever felt that way, right? I, I've, I've got some faith, but do I have enough? And Jesus says, you could have faith the size of a mustard seed, and you can move mountains. He's not asking us for, to have all the faith. Just have at least a little faith. Just try out faith and see if I don't come through for you. See if I don't show up, right? Test me in that. This is the prayer of anyone who seeks to follow Christ. I have faith. Help my lack of faith. 
So that leads us to the doubt of today. Is there even a God to have faith in? Is there evidence or is it just a pious myth, a coping mechanism? Has modern science replaced our need for God? Which I find to be a funny question because if you go back to the founders of like the scientific revolution, almost all of them had an incredibly deep faith, right? Copernicus, Galileo, despite what the church did to him, he had a, he had a great faith. Kepler, Francis Bacon, Pascal, Isaac Newton actually wrote more about theology than he did about science. I mean, these guys had, he had a great faith, and they saw, they uh, saw science not as opposed to or discrediting God, but as two separate ways of thinking about the knowledge of about knowledge and about existence and about the universe. So when I think about God and why I believe in God, and look, I can't prove God is above my pay grade, but but I thought what I'd do today is just share with you um, three of, and, and there's more than that, but three reasons why I, and I consider myself at least a reasonably intelligent person, um, why I choose to believe in and ultimately follow God. And I could spend hours on this and, and uh, give you multiple, multiple reasons, but I'm going to give you three that are, that are some of the most convincing to me. The first is the beauty and rational order of creation. Um, I mean, this is something that almost all human beings throughout time have, have believed, that the beauty and order of creation points, points us towards a divine and benevolent creator, right? And of course, we know more today than people in Bible times did, uh, far more scientifically advanced here. Uh, we've learned more about the cosmos and way things on the earth work. And does it, in our learning of these things, though, does it discredit God, the idea of, of a God, or does it enhance our wonder and our awe of our Creator? Right? I shared a couple of weeks ago images from the new James Webb telescope, and this is another one. This is called the Cartwheel Galaxy. I mean, it's just crazy beautiful, and it's full of millions of stars, and it is 500 million light years away. I don't even know what that means. It's like far, right? And it's crazy to me. And I, I look at it, and I think that God is just like, hey, why don't you go invent a bigger telescope, because i got some more really cool stuff to show you. But when I see it, I think I feel what the psalmist must have felt when he said the heavens declare the glory of God the skies proclaim the work of his hands day after day they pour forth speech night after night they reveal knowledge they have no speech they use no words no sound is heard from them and yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the end of the world I mean, that thing is just up there saying, God is great, God is amazing, God is beautiful, over and over and over. And and that you can go smaller and look at atoms and DNA and fundamental building blocks of life that we're just beginning to try to understand. Do they make us less impressed with the idea of, of a God who created all this? Or if the authors of Scripture had access to the science and the knowledge that we had, would they be less impressed, or would they say even more loudly, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made? When I look at the magnitude and capacity to support life and order and perfection of all that exists, is it really something like this that could have come out of nothing? Just self-generated, developing on its own? I love that science helps us to understand the mechanics, and it it seems to me that no matter the mechanics and the process, there's somewhere an artist and an engineer and a loving God behind all of this. Last year, um, Amelia, my youngest, had a birthday party, and she wanted to have a poppet birthday party. Remember the poppet? Poppets are like these little things that, like, they're at the checkout line and they cost money. Um, and we have a lot. And um, but she wanted a poppet themed birthday party, and so she asked her aunt Sharon, who's a baker at Baron Beak Bakery in Huntington, Indiana. If you ever get a chance to go, 
um, if she could make her a poppet themed birthday cake. And so she made this cake, and it was just crazy beautiful. And those poppets on top, those are made of chocolate. Like, all of that there is edible. You can eat all of that, and it was delicious. It was amazing. And, and if you had come over to my house and, and seen this cake, you'd have said, wow, who made this? And I just said, it just showed up. Like, it just appeared out of the sky. You're like, we found it, you know? You'd have said, no, somebody made this. This, wasn't, this didn't just accidentally come together. This was on purpose, right? Somebody intentionally made this thing. And, and you're right. Somebody did intentionally make this. Somebody who loves Amelia very much. And, and so couldn't just give her, like, because of her ability and what she, what she can do, she couldn't give her just a Walmart, you know, themed cake. It had to be something extravagant and beautiful. That's the only explanation for a cake like this is extravagant love for someone. And maybe that's the only explanation for how big and massive the universe is and how beautiful it is, is that God just couldn't give us a Walmart-themed plain creation. He had to go way above and beyond and make flowers incredibly beautiful and make food taste so good and make love such a wonderful thing. Like, like God just couldn't, couldn't go small because of his love for us. To me, it's a picture of the creator of the universe. It's, it's a, the work of artistry, this expression of love that's been made for us to enjoy. And so that's, that's one reason, I, that's one of the reasons that just compels me. It's the beauty and, and order and magnificence of creation. A, another thing that, that compels me to have faith is my experience of God in my life. Um, maybe you grew up in church and maybe you didn't. I, I did. And it was early on that I remember feeling and sensing as if this was more than a bunch of just fun stories, like this is more than Saturday morning cartoons. There's something real about this. And, and I remember times of prayer or in youth group or on mission trips where I can tell you I felt the presence of God. I, I, I felt you know, sometimes I would read scriptures and it was just the right thing at just the right moment. And you can say that it's just wish fulfillment or, or coincidence or whatever. I can only tell you what I felt. And what I felt was that sometimes singing, I would just so feel a love that the song was singing about or that temptations would flee or, or you know, a, a call to ministry in which I can, I can only tell you it was the nearly audible voice of God. And I don't know how you explain that. But for me, it was all life-changing, and it set my life on a different trajectory. And every day, I continue to seek. I continue to try my very best to live the kind of life I believe he calls me to live. And, and the more I do, the more things make sense to me. And my life changes for the better. And, and all I can say now is that I feel his presence on a daily basis. No matter how unsettling life gets, no matter how messy things are, I feel his peace and, and, and the joy and purpose and meaning and love in my life. And that's what real authentic faith does. It leads us to be more kind and loving and just towards being able to love God and love others in ways that might feel impossible otherwise. There's peace, there's hope, there's joy. I'm a better husband, I'm a better father because of my faith in Jesus. I'm not saying that an atheist can't do these things. I'm just telling you that my experience has been that my faith in God has led me to being a better person and living a better life. It's something real and it's changed me. And I would tell you this, that if at the end of my life, just before my eyes closed for the last time, it was revealed to me that there was no God, and I, to be clear, I believe that there is, um, but, you know, we all struggle with doubt. But even if I found out that there wasn't, I would be glad that I lived as if there were. I would have no regrets, because my life has been made more beautiful through living for God, the God who came to me through Jesus Christ. And, and that kind of leads me to the, the last thing that 
one of the last thing I'll talk about today that, that increases my faith, and it's the impact of faith on other people. Me seeing your faith gives me faith. Not what's happened to me, but what's happened to you, what's happened to other people. I've seen people healed from addiction. I've seen people who were narcissistic jerks who became caring and generous and empathetic. I've seen the hungry fed. I've seen the wounded made whole. I've seen it change communities. I've seen it change our community, right? I think about like best Christmas ever last year uh, where, a, where a community, because of the love of God poured out in them, changed the life of a family who was struggling, right? I've seen children be adopted from foreign countries and, and sponsored through World Vision, and I've seen people compelled to bring hope to the hopeless and, and a kind word to strangers. And again, it's not to say that atheists can't do these things. Many do a lot of great work, but what I know to be true is that the communities of Jesus followers that I have encountered consistently find themselves going out of their way to bless the least and the lost because they are compelled by the love of God and by their love for God. Now, it's hard to explain the movements of kindness and generosity found in the church in any other way than divinely inspired. Your faith gives me faith. The ways you love and care for one another in our community. It's why I'm, I'm always willing to like push the envelope a little bit in our generosity because I believe, I have faith that the love of God in you is going to rise to the occasion. And, and I also see it, by the way, in the hope of resurrection that I've seen in other people. In my times at funerals and celebrations of lives, like uh, the hope that I see, the hope that I see in, uh, when I'm visiting nursing homes and, and people who just know that they know that they know that, that beyond a shadow of a doubt this pain is temporary and eternal life is forever and there's going to be no more pain or crying or tears. Like It's that peace that passes understanding. It gives me faith when I see it in you. It's a peace that for me can only come from one place. It's the divine peace of knowing that Jesus gave his life for us and that our sins, all of our wrongs are forgiven and wiped clean. And because of that, we have hope of living with him in eternity. And so one of the ways that we kind of solidify our hope or speak about our hope is through sharing this common meal together. And sometimes I think we come to this meal and we say, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that's okay. I think that's okay. But we experience it in this way together. And Jesus reminded his disciples in, in, on the night before his death, he tried to make sure that they would have faith because they were about to experience something terrible where it looked like darkness won. And he wanted to remind them that from this point forward, everything's going to be okay. And so he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to God and he said, it's my body, it's broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. Remember me, I've got this. You can have faith in me. And in the same way, when the meal was over, he took the cup and he lifted it and gave thanks to God. He said, it's my blood of the new covenant. It's a new promise, I promise. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me, have faith. Would you pray with me? So God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your power and by your spirit. Make us one with Christ. Make us one with each other. And make us one in ministry to all of the world until that day comes when we get to feast at your heavenly banquet table. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. So friends, in just a moment, we're going to take communion, and I'll invite you. Uh, there will be a station on either side here, and we'll take communion by intinction, meaning you take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup. If you need gluten-free elements, I will be standing with those over here. Or if you prefer, we have some pre-packaged communion elements on the back table back here 
Uh, if you're looking for something that you're thinking is a little bit more sanitary, you can go ahead and grab those and, um, and use those. But no matter what way you participate today, and again, if you're at home, participate right along with us, I want you to know that this, in the United Methodist Church and here at St. Mark's, we practice an open communion, meaning you don't need to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of any church to participate. Just come with a willing and repentant heart, knowing that this gift is for you. I'd like to invite communion stewards to come forward. Let's all sing a chorus of that.
that I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me and it stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood your blood your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me it stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood what can wash Testifies in grace and it tells the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach with not earthly confidence, and it's only by your blood. but your blood nothing but your blood nothing but your blood King Jesus Amen Friends I pray as you go out from this place today that God gives you faith and that Christ gives you peace and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to share the gospel of God's perfect love Amen you turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies Oh, was it people?